Good evening. I'm going to be sharing with you St. Augustine's Daily Meditations for the 12th of June and the title is The Wedding Garment. I ran out of time yesterday to do it and it's now 21.51 on Monday the 13th of June 2026 but I'm going to be doing day six of the ban. I'm banned still on day six and day seven until probably tomorrow. They're trying to tell us how we can pray and who we can pray for. And I broke their medical community guidelines by praying for the dead and the damaged physically. My faith tells me I must pray for them, and God tells me the same. So who is YouTube to tell and direct me how to pray? Anyway, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh my God, I am sorry for all my sins, because they offend you, who are so good, and with your help, I will not sin again. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this night be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. The prayer attributed to Saint Augustine. Breathe into me, Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy, Move in me, Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Attract my heart, Holy Spirit, that I may love only what is holy. Strengthen me, Holy Spirit, that I may defend all that is holy. Protect me, Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. The title, as St. Augustine always put titles, the wedding garment. Explain the wedding garment to us, you will say. There is no doubt at all that it is a garment which only the good have. Those who are to be left at the banquet, preserved for the banquet, to which no bad person has access to be brought through to it by the grace of the Lord. There are the ones who have on, and these are the ones who have on the wedding garment. The prayer. Teach us, Lord, that the wedding garment is love from a pure heart. I'm going to be sharing some more from this book, Catholic Truth, Sixpence It Cost, Autumn 1966. And this is another chapter, and the title says, Nothing Truer Than This Word of Truth. And the author appears to be Roland D. Potter, O.P., these words from St. Thomas's Eucharistic hymn echo the firm conviction of every believing Catholic about all that is of faith. That was up until the 1960s when they had a revolution after Vatican II and we're reaping now what was sown then. 
and particularly about that doctrine which tells us that our Lord is really and truly present after the bread and wine have been consecrated at the Mass. This is indeed a mystery of faith. So we pray for faith and yet more faith. But there may well be some difficulty when we try to explain the belief to ourselves and certainly when we try to explain our Catholic belief to other Christians most difficult of all is to explain anything to unbelievers who would probably not accept the word of Christ. At least let us begin to make clear to ourselves as to others how the real presence is part and parcel of our faith and how it can be and I will add should be defended which means showing that there is a sweet reasonableness in believing what we do believe. Now I'm going to say something here that isn't written. I recently might have even mentioned it in a video, but we have meetings here sometimes, big groups come in and they, they, they knit and natter or what have you and do all this. And uh, I popped in and saw my neighbour in there. She, she's one of the knitters. She's a beautiful knitter. She's just made Deborah a lovely green hat and, and gloves. I took a picture, but I didn't show it on the video. But she's not got the use of her phone, so she'll have to wait for it to arrive. Mind you, she, she can't be in touch because she needs a new phone, but she's cold. So my neighbour, kindly, I had the, the wool. And she knitted it. I, I've tried knitting, but I'm not very good at so what happened, one of these ladies heard me say something to my friend about my faith and she happened to be a Catholic. But she doesn't know her faith as she should because she waited until I'd gone and then she criticised a priest who gives me Jesus Christ on my tongue. She said he was a bad priest. This is what has happened since they allow people to receive Jesus in the hand. That means your hands are not clean. Jesus is the body, which we believe it's truly him, truly God, truly Son of God, truly Jesus Christ is the truly God. You put your other hand in, you put it in your mouth yourself. In Walsingham, bless them, they ask the people who are Catholics who are receiving and the others can go up for a blessing to put Jesus in their mouth in front of the priest because they don't want any harm to come to him. But now people are believing because of all this stuff that's gone on and everybody seems, except me and one or two others, receiving in the hand but it isn't the teaching of the church from the time of Jesus. We are not consecrated to touch and hold the body of Jesus. But we weren't taught that. We were taught that it's okay to receive whichever way we prefer. But me doing all what I do, the Holy Spirit convicted me personally personally, not anybody else, but just for me, my hands are not consecrated. As in the Old Testament, if you're not consecrated, you can't officiate round the altar or do anything or light a fire. As Aaron's son said, they got destroyed by God at the altar for doing something wrong. Um, God is holy, beyond holy, beyond holiness imaginable. I am not worthy 
do receive in my hand my tongue yes it goes from the consecrated hand of the priest onto my tongue this is why I'm sharing this booklet because the teachings will come out in it and you'll hear them and everyone needs to know the truth so I'll continue at least let us begin to make clear to ourselves as to others how the real presence of Jesus Christ is part and parcel of our faith when we receive Holy Communion and how it can be defended which means showing that there is a sweet reasonableness in believing what we do believe St. Paul's evidence the earliest written text dealing with Eucharistic doctrine is in St. Paul's epistle to the Corinthians written about 57 AD that is only 27 years after Jesus Christ died this nearness of St. Paul to our Lord's time is not often or often not understood. He was converted or plunged into the Christian reality as it was in the world then in the year 36, which is only six years after our Lord's death and resurrection. From the beginning St. Paul could have known and did know some eyewitnesses and ministers of the word and some of those men of their apostolic circle as they are referred to by Vatican II which is what I'm trying to get at here on Revelation NN 18 and 19 which is meant a generation partly contemporary with the Apostles but younger than them. When St. Paul comes to write to the Corinthians his teaching is categoric. After going through the words of institution he adds a solemn and significant conclusion. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself or herself. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 29. So do you understand? I understand. So I do not want to bring judgment on myself for receiving the body or blood unworthily. So I will just go for a blessing. I'm not going to offend God. It is quite certain that when St. Paul, who speaks in 10, 16 of a participation in the body of Christ, maintains that some are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord because they fail to discern the body. He means that the bread and wine after consecration become truly the body and blood of Christ. For St. Paul quite definitely the saying of Christ, this is my body, means that really and physically the bread is his body. 
the word of Christ is powerful and effective. It does not simply state that the bread is his body. It decrees that it should be so, that it is so. Here we can profitably quote the words of Father Benno Waite, O.P. The person presiding over a Jewish Paschal meal by commenting on the meaning of the bitter herbs which is what they have at the Passover if you've ever done a Passover I have in Jamaica and the lamb really gave these foods an extra value the efficacy of Jesus words yields nothing to the realism of the biblical right and in fact surpasses it by far because the object of this commemoration is of an entirely new order. The elements used in the new rite are no longer the minor details of a divine intervention whose remembrance helps those participating to relive it. They are the essentials of a new and conclusive intervention. They are the actual objects of the sacrifice which has redeemed the world, which must be made actually present and renewed in order to affect in their physical bodies those who participate in it. You can be healed when you go up to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ when you receive it. You can be healed instantly of anything. You just ask him, Jesus. The Eucharist in the New Testament, page 94. Certainly St. Paul and all the first generation of Christians understood the doctrine in a thoroughly realist way, not however to the point of being grossly materialist. The sacrament supposes faith and the flesh of Christ would be nothing without the spirit dwelling in it. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. John 6, 63 verse. The body is that of the risen Christ. Different from the earthly body received from Adam and made to die on the cross. It is the spiritual body of Christ in his glory. Yet still the same body which has been transformed and has passed from the perishable to the imperishable from weakness to power from the physical to the spiritual 1 Corinthians 15 verses 42 to 44 it is a body spiritualized yet still real Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side, says our Lord to St. Thomas, John 20 verse 27. It is this body which is under the appearance of bread in order to be communicated to us. The next title, A Bearer of Revelation. St. Paul and his contemporaries who held and taught such doctrine were very conscious of living in and handing on a tradition. 
For I received from the Lord that I also delivered to you. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23 I preach to you the gospel which you received, in which you stand. 15 verse 1 Paul the teacher and theologian was eminently a bearer of the revelation. This very significant fact emerges from the text we have cited and also from the gospel which was preached by me came through a revelation of Jesus Christ Galatians 1 verse 9 to 12 what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do Paul Philippians 1 rather Philippians 4 rather sorry Philippians 4 verse 9 as therefore you received Christ Jesus the Lord so live in him Colossians 2 verse 6 such teaching stemming from Christ constituted a tradition to this he God called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14 and follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me 2 Timothy 1 verse 13 it is important to note that St. Paul was not referring to any traditions but to a holy Christian tradition completely authoritative because Christ himself proclaimed its truths and was origin and fountainhead of all the wonderful work of God as well as of the divine assistance that accompanied it. Excuse me, I have a tickle on my nose. It's cold. I've had since March 25th. It's never completely gone. Our Lord, indeed, is Supreme Master and requires that we submit to him. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. John 13 verse 13. Like other masters in Israel, he gathered disciples about him, and the twelve in particular sent out to preach Matthew 10 verse 14 for this purpose he educated them by special instructions of which they were to make a tradition the roles of master and pupil in the Hebrew world have been specially studied in recent times. This is 1966 and no doubt even now. The result is that we have more light on the origins and development of a Christian tradition. A tradition which owed much to the fact that our Lord was master and his followers, disciples, taught by him, taught too, to hand on a living word which was to save the world. A living word because the master presented his own person and the disciples not only listened 
but also followed. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, John 6, verse 68. A disciple or pupil in Hebrew schools would strive to retain fully and exactly his master's teaching. To be able to reproduce it exactly was an ideal often attained. Something of this attitude must have obtained among the first Christians, the more so as they were all lovers of Christ, intent upon retaining all that God wished them to remember of the saving word and then to hand that treasure on to succeeding generations. Theirs was no ordinary schooling, but all absorbing love bore them on, and the abiding spirit, sent of God, presided over the dawn of the church's tradition as of its subsequent growth. The next title, The Gospels. Now, we can now turn to the accounts in the Gospels. These accounts are narratives of the Last Supper and institution of the Holy Eucharist. Besides that of St. Paul mentioned above, there are three Gospel narratives. Matthew 26 verses 26 to 29 Mark 14 verses 22 to 25, Luke 22 verses 15 to 20. When we look at all four accounts together and compare them, we see that each has its own character, mode of writing and variance. Just a moment, I need to have a little drink. Thank you. Excuse me a moment. Saint Teresa, such variants worried Saint Teresa of Lisieux, as she tells us. Yet she need not have worried. Sorry. Each evangelist has his own style and working. We must not expect photographic and meticulous sameness. The essential mind and word of Christ shines through. This is my body. And it is good to remember that the very words of the institution which we use in the canon of the Mass today do not correspond in detail to any particular Gospel text, yet they give and effect the meaning and mind of Christ. Literary analysis seems to show that our sources are not entirely independent. Thus St. Matthew's account, as we have it, appears to depend on St. Mark. St. Luke may do so in part too. His Eucharistic narrative, however, is concerned to oppose the Jewish Passover. Luke 22 verses 15 to 18 to the new Christian reality 19 to 20. St. Mark's narrative with its Aramaic tone 
is probably of ancient Palestinian origin. St. Paul, by contrast, seems to be handing on the tradition of a Greek-speaking or Hellenistic church as for example at Antioch. Well, I have two adopted daughters from Palestine and they've been with me since 2010 and they told me many times that their ancestors were Christians and then of course other forces and powers came and things changed. If you have a sword or a gun at your head you might well change to something else. I'll just say those few words that's all. Um, these things have happened and happening. So this very briefly is what can be got from literary analysis of the narratives. It is important to realize that in fact all our accounts of the institution of the Blessed Sacrament are in the form of liturgical traditions. And perhaps the very words pronounced in the community celebration at Jerusalem and Antioch when they reenacted and made present the Last Supper of our Lord. In St. Mark's account we have a bare concise text reduced to essentials making no attempt to record all that actually happened at the Last Supper. It is certain that there has been no distortion, only a simplification. Our first Christian brethren preserve the important actions and words to which our Lord our first Christian brethren preserve the important actions and words to which our Lord attached a new value. The rest could be set aside. It is in this sense that Vatican II, which is the controversy that's being discussed and it's still 50 odd years later the same thing facing, tells us that the Gospel writers made a selection of some of the many things that had been transmitted orally or in writing. Some of these they related in an abbreviated form or explained with due regard for the situation of the churches on Revelation 19. It seems certain that the evangelists and St. Paul give us accounts which retain the very formulas which the first communities used in celebrating the Eucharist. The accounts of St. Paul and St. Mark serve particularly to bring us near to the origin of the tradition. Taking all together, we can say with Vatican II that the Gospels faithfully hand on what Jesus Christ, while living among men, really did and taught for their eternal salvation until the day he was taken up to heaven. Acts 1 verses 1 to 2. At the forefront of this teaching would of course be what he did and said about his body and blood. Further it seems certain that our Lord's last meal was a paschal feast 
or in the atmosphere of a Paschal feast. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Luke 22 verse 15 It is known from Jewish writings how this important annual rite was performed. The events recorded in the Gospel Can easily be fitted into the full Jewish rite. The ancient commemorative meal of the Hebrews when they recalled how God had freed his people from Egypt was now to give place to a commemoration, an actual reenactment of a new and final reality. Hebrews 8 verse 27 and 9 verse 12 issuing from the mind and will of the risen Christ. Do this in commemoration of me. Will be uttered to the end of the world and the children of God in all that time will be enabled really and truly to receive him into their hearts for their sanctification and salvation nothing truer than this word of truth that's the end of that there are translations of documents in second vatical written there but i'm not going to read any of it not to you <laughs> thank you so much for listening may god bless you and heal you i'm sending you his peace in abundance so this was day six of the ban so after day seven I shall be uploading many many videos uh, probably YouTube won't like that much either <laughs> God bless you thank you